Uh, today's speaker is Rig Maroy, and she's going to teach us how to hack humans on the fly. Uh, Rig is a social worker and educator who enjoys recoding people on her spare time. Uh, Rig has spent 15 years educating hundreds of people of all ages and ability in the social skills necessary to become the, cha uh, the change they wish to see in the world. Rig teaches civics and critical thinking via 23B Hackerspace in Fullerton, California. Please welcome. All right, so humans in the wild, how to hack humans on the fly. What do I mean by on the fly? Psychological-based social engineering is, is the term coined by Charles Lively, no matter how awkward that phrase is. Um, I am not talking about stuff where you have to write a code or like involve technology at any point. I'm s if you are doing OSINT or you're on the street and need to change something that's happening in front of you, that's where you come in. If you run into problems while you're doing recon or doing an attack and something tertiary happens that you need to take care of people right away, I'm giving the infrastructure for how to read people enough to be able to decide what approach is best. And if you've studied social engineering, this is going to be, a, uh, some of this will be repeating so people who aren't familiar with all the terms can catch up with some of them. Uh, humans are volatile, right? That's, that's our perception. Humans, they get mad at nothing. They get, they can go from zero to throwing stuff and calling the cops for not getting the right chicken nuggets in 60 <laughs> minutes, right? Um, but chaos theory, you know, and, and chaos theory, I'm, crazy stuff happens, situations come up, right? Any, you know, anytime, the best laid plans don't exist. Right? We work from our toolkit and hope that our plans work out, and if they don't, we have to be able to pivot and modify. Uh, so, humans, am I right? <laughs> they're complex, although from another, from another perspective, they're, program they're programmatic. We can think that they're hard to read, but really they're easy to classify as well. Um, they might be unpredictable, but statistically, humans are not that interesting. Uh, they can be very sensitive, but that means that they're vulnerable. If you find someone's big red butt and then you push it enough times, <laughs> as long as you have an escape plan, it can be super fun. <laughs> the weakest point in any system, right? That's the mantra, that's one of the mantras of social engineering. Humans are the weakest point in any system because they're so vulnerable, they're so exploitable. So much stuff, you just have to push them in the right way mentally and they will do the things because we are ultimately a lazy species, uh, and they're, therefore they're the most exploitable point in any system. So, some situations in security, OSINT, right, you might need, you can get more information with this. If you know how to read the person you're talking to, you can phrase your questions, you can alter your approach, change your persona to best adapt to the needs to get as much information as you can. Uh, some of you probably are going to know what I'm talking about, some might not. Have, for women, have you ever done that thing where you, within like two minutes, have all the conversation information download between each other? One time I had a roommate bring home a girlfriend and he was like, you guys get to know each other, you know, and he went to his room and within those two minutes, all the damage had been done and he had realized that he shouldn't have left two women alone and he ran back in the living room and was like, ah, I'm like, nah, I already told her. Uh, <laughs> um, I used to call it the female frequency. <laughs> Um, but just by knowing and connecting with someone, you know how to talk to them, you know how to get that communicative flow. Attacks can be stronger and more productive, right? You can get that much more done if you're approaching from the right way. Someone who's helping you, they might be helpful, they might help you a bit, but if they like you or if they understand you or if you are talking to them in the right way is something they recognize that they need to respond more to, you get more. Um, Spot checks, right? In security, you want to check your own system. If you own a company, you want to make sure that all of your employees actually read the one-page social engineering training you gave them, right? So dropping in and, or, or having someone drop in and try just mini hacks, just mini pushing people and seeing what falls should just be company policy, is for, in my opinion. In civilian life, at the store, you see a guy yelling at a woman in front of, at the clerk in front of you, right? Holding up the line and being a dick, and there's like four things wrong with the whole situation. 
uh, at college, there's, oh, there's so many things that went wrong in college, uh, a protest that is cr making uh, the onlookers volatile. Uh, I, if any of you went to like a West Coast university, you might have encountered the, the preacher and his friend, and the friend holds like a giant sign saying like, women, minorities, homosexuals, repent. Um, that's fun too. <laughs> and at, uh, at church, someone is not behaving well or the community is sick. Uh, so this works on a community scale too, as long as you know enough social psychology to know how humans stereotype their thought when they're among other like minds. Uh, so the mantra of social engineering, according to Turillo, is be professional, be calm, and know your mark. But if you're on the street and something's happening in front of you, you don't have time, so what do you do, right? If you try the same social engineering hack when you're doing spot checks at your company, word's gonna get around at some point, right? Oh, this guy was talking to me and he asked me this. Oh my God, he asked me that too. And that's all it takes for people to figure it out depending on what level they are in your company. Um, let's see, so what is your toolkit? Your wisdom stats, right? Your charisma stats are huge and your intelligence stats. Uh, those are, I mean, it's the basis of all social engineering that involves face-to-face -face communication, but the charisma thing is something that can be learned and developed as long as you're you know, willing to really study what it is that makes people who everyone's drawn to, like what about them is drawn, are they drawn to? And usually it's their charisma, they exude something, they exude confidence or humor or like intensity and you, people are drawn to that and they wanna watch and they wanna engage with it. Privilege, everybody has some level of privilege, right? You the, you know, in, in America, it's like cis white males of above like 30 and then other people depending on what they have. But also like if you're straight, if you're homosexual, depending on, you know, if you're male, female, whatever race, it entirely depends on the situation, how you use what privilege you do have and how you assess what privilege they have or don't have. Uh, knowledge of the given system you're trying to hack, right? So if you're trying to get a cop to leave a friend alone, it helps if you know how the law actually works and what the process actually is before you try to engage uh, so, you know, someone on their own level. You've, I think we've all seen that person yelling at a cop about like, my friend's a lawyer and he says, you know, stealing like nuclear codes is totally okay. <laughs> and you're, yeah. Um, Psychology, in psychology, the, the subsets that we are most likely to need to study, evolutionary psychology, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but evolutionary psychology tells us that people's main drives are feeding, fighting, and sexual reproduction. Um, and if you can, and a lot of times, people who are agitated are coming from one of those three places. Uh, so that's the first thing that I would say to obsess. And, uh, assess, and you do that by reading evolutionary psychology books, uh, not listening to, to bros. Um, <clears throat> social psychology, knowing how people work in groups is huge. People will respond much better to things and they will try much harder if there are other people around them or other people involved in the process. If they are in a group of like-minded like people moving for a single cause, like a, you know advocacy group or whatever, knowing how people turn in from individuals who make okay decisions to a mass of a person, you know, one person shared across many minds and knowing how to manipulate that is fun and for the whole family. Uh, developmental, how people develop. Some people, how people have grown up, I know it sounds cheesy, but how people grow up, how they're raised what culture they're from, what subculture they're from, what religion they were raised in, any of these things you can find, what socioeconomic class, probably fed into how they were raised. It probably fed into how people reacted to them and how they learned what people are and how they learned to react to people, right? Uh, uh, you have two siblings, one, two, two fraternal twins. One is like beautiful and one is not and raised in the same household but their parents teach or treat the pretty one kinder. They're more willing to let stuff slide. The teachers will do the same thing, right? Um, we know that teachers call on more attractive students more often. 
teachers spend, are more willing to spend time and more willing to accept mistakes from more attractive children. It's not fair, but it's not something everyone's aware of either, or take steps to fix. Fashion, uh, the psychology of fashion can tell you, again, socioeconomic status, basic belief system, if they're wearing a uniform, you know, and you know what that training entailed to get into that uniform, you know something about them. If they're wearing shoes that most people couldn't afford, you know something about them, you know something about the way they interact with the world. If they're wearing sandals and you know, jean shorts, you know that they're not particularly worried about social pressure or peer pressure, right? Like you can tell how, what kind of attack would be useful sometimes just by what they're wearing and how they carry themselves, basically. And then logic. Logic is huge. A lot of people don't have it. If you have better logic than the person you're, you're studying or attacking, you've already got a leg up on them a lot of times. Social politics. Uh, it really does help if you know the current state of social politics in the world. Not as you read about it on Reddit, but like if you actually read like AP News and BBC News and Reuters and those kind of ones with more of the bias paired out, you can start to see the dynamics of certain social demographics across populations and across, um, and that can inform that can inform outcome, it can inform how you attack, it can inform whether you take a risk or not, because ultimately, if something is, if you're taking a dangerous risk, then there's going to be other people after the fact that will also have to weigh in, and you need to be aware of and mitigate consequences as best you can. Um, and then you need everything else. Anything you can read, learn as many things as you're interested in, study things. I, my ADD ass has taken like <laughs> uh, martial arts, dancing, massage, like I speak five languages, I just, I just have a short attention span, but it also means that in any given conversation, someone says a thing and it's odds are I can talk about it with them. We can make that connection really quickly. Uh, contextual knowledge, know what your context is, what your setting is, uh, be aware of if you're in downtown LA, in like the fashion district, the cops are gonna behave different than if you're in like San Gabriel or San Pedro or something because they're more relaxed and not used to being always on the attack or always on the defensive. Uh, every book ever, yeah, same thing. Just read as much, the more you read things written by humans, the more you can learn about human psychology. What they're writing isn't as important as why they're writing it and how they came to those conclusions. Um, you don't have to believe everything you read, but just knowing that that's how some people think and that's a possible thought process is, is enlightening and it helps you read people on the street. So trust the process, just like any other engineering thing. What's your problem, right? What is the problem ahead of us? And we need to be specific. What is the actual thing that we, can, that we need changed right now? In the clerk, in the, uh, the clerk being yelled at by the customer example, the problem isn't just that he's abusing a clerk, he's taking too much time, you need him to hurry up, he might be being a bad influence or scaring other people around as well, like children that are around might be like, why is everyone okay with this person yelling at that person? That doesn't seem like things I learned at school. So then what's your goal? Once you have your concrete problems laid out, what is your concrete goal? To make him stop talking, or make him stop yelling, to make him uh, feel bad about himself, <laughs> to make him think about what he did, to make, you know, what are you trying to do to fix the situation? What do you need to do to not just fix the situation, make sure it doesn't, he doesn't boomerang and come back, right? You don't wanna anger someone so much that they like storm out and then wait for you in the parking lot. <laughs> you want to do it in a way that they know they're wrong, but you haven't given them any extra energy for them to fight back about. So, Ascent, that's mostly, what a lot of the reading people part is, right? You are, you can guess from their, the way they carry themselves, the way they're dressed, the way they look, the way whatever, kind of what their background is, you can adjust your attitude towards that. Um, and your context and your setting and everything, what you can use around you. Formulate, you can form, you know, then you formulate your plan of attack and then you attack and then you record or report it. If it's for, if it's insecurity, you do it formally. If it's on the street, you do it on Facebook. 
So exercise, build your thesis. For each of the following hypotheticals, decide what are the problems in each situation? What are the goals in each, each situation? And so just those first two parts. At the store, we talked about in college, uh, the protester that is fomenting problems, right? There, it's, uh, people are starting to get agitated. You can sense that tension in the audience. Someone throws something at the speaker, at the protest guy. It all sounds well and good to attack a random person on your college campus, but they tend to look down on it in the long run. <laughs> so how do you stop all of that animosity and get everyone else to calm down and not mind what this guy is saying or doing? Uh, and in the field, again, spot checks. Uh, so if someone, so okay, for in my field of work, social work, one of the best slash worst hacks I ever found is that me saying I'm a social worker to a government agency means they don't check shit. They don't really do the security checks. They don't need to hear the person's voice I'm speaking on behalf of. They don't need, they, you know, I have to have like a, you know, date of birth and name and social security number, but if you've managed to acquire that, the attack becomes super easy um, because they don't care <laughs> enough or they're too complacent, or there's no like strong enough policies in line to stop them from doing that. And the turnover's crazy because it's stressful jobs and blah, 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 no one, you know, it's way too easy to say my job is X thing that's important but, but benign. <laughs> and then people are like, oh, well in that case, have this. It's not cool. Anyway, um, so what are the problems? What are the goals, right? Uh, let's see. So Austin, so then we assess what we have in front of us, right? First thing we talk about, in term, and this is in terms of uh, Maslow uh, evolutionary psychology. We, from that, we come with the idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People will react like animals if their first two levels are not met, right? They go into animal defensive mode. They might snap, they might withdraw. It really depends on the energy you're getting from them or what that person's experiences have been. Um, physiological needs though, food is usually one of the major problems. One time I was a computer consultant at UCLA and this chick came in raving at me. She's like, I need to get a computer because my boss just got on a plane. I have to get on a plane too. And I'm like, would you like a cookie? <laughs> you sound hungry. And she was like, Okay, and I'm like, all right, here's a cookie. Go sit at that computer, I'll sign it over to you. <laughs> and then we're cool. She's like, thank you, and like went and sat down. <laughs> like, but because I was aware physiological needs should be my first check, that was the first, you know, like that worked out. Um, same thing with safety needs. If people do not feel safe, they are less willing to engage calmly. Um, which is why when economies are worse, crime rates go up, right? People are less likely to hold on to their civilized ideals when they're starving or homeless or things like that because then it's a survival thing. Uh, then you need love and belonging, people around you, understanding. It goes a long way to be nice to people because honestly a lot of people just don't have anyone they feel they connect to so, or they don't have that many people or they don't feel like they have enough people. So being that person people can connect to even if it's only for a few minutes on the phone or a few minutes on the street, super helps out. Um, and, you know, and then self-esteem, giving people compliments. Uh, we have many studies showing that giving a person a compliment somewhere in your conversation or giving them, acknowledging that you respect them for whatever helps you get to your goal faster. Uh, in tipping studies, they showed that when a server gives people a mint with their check, tipping goes up by 3%. But if the, t if the server puts, like, puts the check down, walks away, and then goes, oh, I forgot, okay, I, get, I got these for you nice people. <laughs> like, I just, you know, I got you these extra mints. And make it something special, tipping went up by 43%. <laughs> or 23, you know, some ridiculous amount, anyway. Um, privilege and power dynamic. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more, but depending on what the privilege level is of all the parties involved, you can figure out where your where your power over them stands and you can excise that or the, your power under them. If they are more powerful than you, then you need to know how to, you know, either show your belly in a way that they think they're winning and then you change it or you, 
or you can come in like you own the place because you know you have the right to just, uh, I believe there's a term gaijin smash, where you just like walk through stuff <laughs> and because you're privileged and fuck them very much, basically. Um, setting, what's happening around you? Not just the downtown, not just the inner city versus like suburbs thing, but like, are there, are there people around you? Are there witnesses? Can you use the witnesses as peer pressure for the people? Can you use, you know, are there rocks in case it goes bad? <laughs> uh, and all, uh, situation, again, situation, it, these are all variable. And what emotion is there? What emotion are you getting from that person? What emotion do you feel that you need to either tamp down or tap into depending on what's called for? And you want to create a, generally you want to create a neutralized situation. So it goes a long way to be the chill person when other people are freaking out. If someone's kind, then the emotion is, you know, joy and you want to turn it into rapture. You, d <laughs> you don't just want them to be happy to be talking to you because they love their job and they're super happy to answer questions from curious people. You want them to like you so they tell you whole stories about how their system works and their, you know, their world works. Um, so formulating attack, choose a persuasion method. <clears throat> uh, in studies, we have those broken down to reciprocity. Uh, so if, we're, if reciprocity is what's in order, if making someone feel indebted to you, you do something for them, you give them a compliment, they feel like they should owe you something back. Uh, so, using, so this is the helpful vector, um, making someone feel helpful. Scarcity, fear vector. I don't like using fear vector at all. I, I think it makes people more volatile, it makes them more unpredictable because you're tapping into that animal thing, right? So someone's back is against the wall, they lash out. So I try to, or they shut down. And either way, it's not helpful if you're trying to gather data. So I, I don't love the scarcity thing, but telling people, you know, we've only got five days left in our like 300% off sale or whatever, then people freak out and run to the store or do whatever you tell them because stuff's running out. Authority. Authority works in all vectors, and it's just something people should practice doing, especially if they're engineers. Just walking into a room and being like, okay, here's what's happening. Not with anger, not with like shaking your finger in people's face, just walking in with the assumption that you definitely know something that they all don't know, and that they should probably listen to you because you know the thing, <laughs> and that's, what, that's how life works. Consistency, using the comfort zone Vector. Um, so if you're doing this on the fly, consistency, you have to seed or prime them in the same conversation, right? This is all stuff where you don't have time to prep, you don't have time to like come back later once you've seeded. So you seed it early on in the conversation and then you reap by the, hopefully, you know, within the next 10, 20, 15 minutes, however long the conversation takes. Liking. Uh, so that affects both the helpful vectors and the dis or comfort, the discomfort or comfort zone vectors, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, making people feel more comfortable makes, you know, makes them want to do more stuff. And then consensus, this works in the discomfort zone vector. This is where peer pressure comes in, but this is also where, like, I'm so glad you chose this, because that's what we're all doing, so I'm super happy. And then people are like, oh, we're all doing this? Okay, well. Um, then you formulate your attack, right? Once you've chosen your, your persuasion method. S well, I did this out of order. Cool. Um, choose your attack vector, so which is informed by, you know, as we said, informed by your persuasion method. Careless or simple? Careless is, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it works. It depends on what kind of information you're trying to get. Careless is where people, like, leave their cell phones open. <laughs> and you can see like their, or their screens are on and you just happen to see the documentation you're not supposed to see or stuff like that. That's careless. People get, our minds take a lot of sh shortcuts naturally. Our brains are super lazy about processing because there's so much to process all the time. So we tend to ignore stuff that's not important and our brains decide for us what's not important, right? Our attention spans are not built to take in everything all the time. So, and following, too many rules, if, you're, you know, if your security rules are an entire book, odds are people are going to start dropping shit because it's not practical to the job that they're doing. It's not practical to the thing that they're doing, so they get careless. Um, let's see, uh, which isn't, all right, we did that part. Discomfort zone 
uh, or f is familiar. So you want to feel familiar to people if you want them to happily tell you stuff. If you're trying to stop something, you want to make them feel uncomfortable. You can either make them feel, yeah, so the preacher on the street or on, at, at UCLA uh, that was preaching hate and getting all riled up, including vets, he started talking about like doing the whole like, thank God for dead veterans stuff. And I was like, okay, so, and it was during 9-11, or it was during like a year or two after 9-11 had, had happened. So he was causing issues <laughs> and uh, I made him realize that this was not the place that he was going to be listened to in a constructive manner. <laughs> uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Using peer and social pressure. So what I did, who's done Rocky Horror Picture Show like in the theaters? Yeah, all right, so call and response, right? They say something, you say something hilarious afterwards, <laughs> and then the entire audience laughs. I just started Rocky Horror picturing, like, the, like for two hours, the protest, because it made people laugh, it calmed everyone behind me down. He got mad, but he realized he couldn't do anything about it, because I had a wall of people behind me that were all just enjoying the show, and no longer cared about what he was saying. He was just entertainment now. Um, helpful or assistive nature, asking someone, hey, can you do this for me? Most people say yes, we want to be helpful, we want to be liked, we want to be respected, and we do that by helping each other. We tend to grow up in this country especially thinking that no one really will help another person. But if any of you remember the 92 Northridge earthquake, like all of a sudden you knew all your neighbors' names, everybody was sharing food and camping out and singing songs and it was a whole thing. Uh, people want to be helpful. It is not hard to press someone into your service or to get someone to do a thing for you uh, under the guise of, man, this would really help me out. Most people are cool. If it doesn't take more than like a few minutes out of their day, they'll do it. Avoid fear and emotional, again, because unless you're really sure about your privilege calculus, you can put someone in fear, you can use your authority to scare someone, you can put someone in fear for their job or whatever, as, not their life, because that's a whole other level of fear, but it works better if you know that your privilege rides over theirs. Um, so, comfort zone vector. You have to create the comfort zone to exploit it, right? Unless you're in their house and some shit's happening that you want to change, which isn't polite, but it happens. Um, you, if they're on the street, you need to create the comfort zone. You do that by making yourself the comfort zone. You become the person that is not a threat. You become the thing around them that's not a threat, um, but is still telling them what to do. So, lightning is the big one, right? Sildani wrote about, uh, about the different types of approaches, or, anyway, so. Uh, eye contact is big. People do not, in this country, do not trust people they don't make eye contact with, right? If you were raised here, eye contact's huge. If you were raised in China, it's a little bit of a different story depending on the conversation, depending on the interaction, the age difference, all kinds of stuff, right? Some countries, in America, uh, personal space for just your friends is about three feet. In other countries, like there's some South, Ameri South American countries where this is personal space. <laughs> and Americans will freak out and step back, but understanding that that's just them is, you know, and being able to maintain that eye contact no matter how weirded out they made you. Uh, smiling, smiling helps. We trust people who are smiling, not smiling manically, but genuinely smiling, <laughs> right? Not like, we don't want that. <laughs> Good humor, jokes help so much. The preacher at UCLA, like, he wasn't my target, right? The people behind me were my target. They're the people I'm trying to change. Using jokes made them feel more relaxed with me, made them feel like I had it, so they didn't have to get all upset about it. Like, jokes break through a lot of stuff. People, workers who are super stressed out at a company, I tell them a joke on the phone, they relax, they help me super extra. <laughs> because I made their day more worth it. <clears throat> Excuse me, my day more worth it. Their day more worth it. Relaxed posture, you do not want tension in your shoulders and your back, you want you want to look like you're cool with the situation. Even if they're not, you're fine. They can try to get at, mad at you, but you let that emotional energy, you shoulder roll it, you just let it pass you by. Uh, and then finding common ground, finding something that they will like you about, right? If 
you know, uh, hey man, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian and I believe in all this stuff, but let's talk about why you have your seven daughters and chastity belts <laughs> and need to show the keys to everybody at UCLA. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, humanize yourself. It, we don't care about people as a species, but we care about humans. We don't care about groups because they're faceless. We care about individuals because they've told us that they are actually people we need to care about. Humanizing yourself is a matter of, usually is a matter of making eye contact, smiling, uh, maybe even sharing something vulnerable that seems vulnerable about yourself. You don't have to be like, well, I'm really afraid of spiders, but you, you know, just say, oh, I know that pain, man. This time this thing happened, and no, I get it. And they're like, oh, you're a person. I will trust you and interact with you and not just treat you like a customer, just treat you like a, you know. Um, and then authoritative. Uh, you need a non-challenging power stance. So <laughs> it's hard with the table in the way. Power stance, uh, if you've taken drama or anything like that, is shoulder feet shoulder length apart, um, shoulders rolled up and back, head lifted. Like, this is, this is more powerful than, you know, when, hmm. this makes sure that they're going to pay attention to you. If this is a visual or physical interface issue, then making sure that, you know, you are standing like you own the ground you're standing on does that psychological thing of just giving you that little bit more in the power dynamic. They want to listen to you a little bit more. You're not fucking around, but you're not being, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so power stance is specifically that stance, but putting your hands on the table would psychologically work. This is a firm surface. You're resting against it. You can feel like, I'm not sure how to explain it without sounding like crazy. This isn't like, it's energy work, but it's that, um, I don't know, we build from this. We build from how our hands feel. We build from firm surf surfaces. You, it's much harder to have a power stance on sand <laughs> than it is on concrete. Um, so we, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, you own this dais. You own being up here. <coughs> Clear, strong voice, right? Speak from the diaphragm. You're not yelling, you are just projecting. This especially works if you're doing peer pressure, right? You are talking to them, but you are really talking to everyone around you. <laughs> they are just, yeah. Uh, so clear, strong voice. There's no miscommunication. You're not mumbling. You're, there's no way they can mistake the conversation that you're having, unless they have audio processing issues or whatever. Uh, it, it helps. It, it makes things faster. Committed to your statements. The things you say need to still be true five minutes later, right? Don't. That's the easiest way to give yourself away in any, in any attack is if you suddenly change things. Some stuff you can change and people will actually let it slide. And, some, and you can sometimes do that on purpose. You can say one thing and then a few minutes later say something slightly different and they might not catch it. But that takes a lot of like linguistic study and, and or just talking to a lot of people and seeing how well you can get away with stuff until you have an actual situation in front of you. And then keeping an even tone. We don't raise our voices, we don't get worried. We don't even tell them we're moderately upset. We're just bored with the situation, we'd like it to be fixed, or we're delighted to be talking to them because they're so sweet, but you need to keep the tone even. If they think you're volatile, then it becomes the animal thing of withdrawing, right? We don't trust people because we're afraid of them. Same thing with them. They don't trust me because I'm not stable. I'm not someone that they feel like they can have a safe conversation with. So the discomfort zone vector. Uh, I don't know why my animations went all out of order. Anyway, uh, so consensus, again, uh, disrupt their comfort zone. If they are in a comfortable situation, like the preacher preaching at UCLA, I make it uncomfortable by making sure they understand everybody else is not mad at him. <laughs> he is not getting the negative energy he is seeking. He is getting everyone being like, ha, it's funny because you're here. Or, you know, it, and it becomes less... It takes the wind out of the sails, right? You're taking away the ground that they're standing on. It's like a psychological power stance, but you're like, you know, kneecapping them. It's great. Um, peer pressure works. So, again, making him aware of the people around him, 
the thing that helped the most was at some point he did start for me, like he raised his Bible and like came at me and a Jehovah's Witness preacher from further down Bruin Walk got in front of him and was like, and after that he started being a lot more circumspect about how he was reacting <laughs> to the way I was talking and getting everyone else to react to him. Uh, Non-confrontational. Depending on your power and your privilege and how you were raised and what you've been experienced in your life, you don't necessarily want to even risk a confrontation, right? You want to accomplish what you're doing without, sometimes without getting into it. I don't mind being confrontational, but also being the calm one or directing the thing that you're saying to someone else so they specifically hear it. <laughs> uh, all that works if you need, if it's a safety issue. The, you know, a dude yelling at the clerk the first time I ever saw it was when I was like, like five or something. No eight, and my sister was three, and we were both already assholes because our parents raised us, but uh, the guy was yelling at the clerk, my mom turned to us, and she was like, now girls, if I ever hear either of you talk to another human being the way that motherfucker is talking to that poor woman over there, I will kick both of your asses. She knew there was everyone else standing around. She, she wanted him to feel like an asshole, and you do that by creating peer pressure, but she was being non-confrontational because she's a woman in the 80s, and like, abuse is a thing still, and like men attacking women was still kind of like, cops would be like, are you sure he attacked you? Was he just using his hands really strong and you're just being a woman? Like, you know, so her way of getting around that is not directing the energy at him, directing it to us so everyone else got it. My sister and I, again, being assholes, we were like, yes, mama. <laughs> she was like, uh, we like to make it worse. Anyway, taking the moral high ground. Again, in that situation, my mother's right, right? There's no world in which yelling at another human being is like, oh, that was a good way to handle your, <laughs> your issues. Um, so she's already on the moral high ground. There's nothing he can do to react to that, right? He can turn on her, but she hasn't confronted him. She hasn't started anything with him. What's he, you know, and he knows he's wrong. If he, once he hears it out loud, he knows he's wrong. A lot of times when we're angry, we don't get that other stuff is happening around us, right? We get focused at the thing we're angry at. We make more mistakes because we're letting stuff pass us by. We get more careless. So, but if that anger doesn't have anywhere to go, eventually it'll snap people out of anger and more into distressed contemplation because they're still agitated. They still have all those fight or flight chemicals in their body, but they can't do, it, do anything with it and it tends to confuse people. Uh, <clears throat> so exploit the setting, turn against undesirable behavior, right? My mom's using the fact that we're in a public place and that there's lots of people around being inconvenienced with this, this dude to use that to pressure him and to stop being awful. Uh, and then remove yourself from the complacent narrative. The reason abusers in public get away with abusing in public is because no one calls them out on it. Uh, as, you know, it, it would be great if everyone would stand up and you know, say, hey, that's not cool. But the society we live in, that's not always going to happen. Not everyone's going to feel safe about it. Or people will be like, well, someone else will take care of it. So if you remove that from their narrative, they think everyone's cool with what I'm doing because they're not saying anything. <laughs> then fuck, you know, then you, you're the person who says something. And all of a sudden, all the stuff they were taking for granted isn't actually there. All that, that contextual ability to do these things has been removed because they, they're no longer able to tell themselves that everyone's just going to be cool and let them, let them do whatever they want to do. Um, so in the helpful vector, people want to be helpful and assistive. Why? In evolutionary psychology, it's because if we help other people, other people will help us. That will help us like propagate as a species, right? The more people are helped, the healthier our species becomes long run. Uh, for, and then there's the reciprocity thing. People just don't like to feel indebted. You know, most of us are, most of us are inculcated with that idea that we sh if someone does something for you, you do something nice back. Um, so at the hacker space, um, one of the things I'll do for uh, if new people come to 23B is if they look lost, I, you know, sometimes I'll just go up and introduce myself, but if we're doing something, I'll be like, hey, you, new kid, carry this table, and they'll do it, because they want to be helpful. They want to feel needed and ingratiate themselves to the system. Um, and that's the other thing it, it ingratiates. Uh, and then at the post office, um, 
Man, I forgot why I put the post office one. Sorry, I don't remember that one, but yeah, people want to be helpful. If you ask someone to hold something for you, sometimes they'll put down their thing, <laughs> and that can help too, depending on what you're trying to collect. Um, at the store, all right, so we have the female clerk yelling at her to honor his expired coupon. The problem in this one is, for the clerk, it's that she's getting abused, right? Like, she has the service job, she's on her feet all day, and some asshole is suddenly yelling at her because he's super wrong and just wants her to like bypass a computer system she doesn't really know how to use like that. There's nothing she can do and it might, you know, might not even be able to call the manager because he's being too interfering in you know, what she's doing. For the observers, my mom's biggest thing with that whole situation was that he was being a bad influence on us. She didn't want us growing up thinking that that was a thing that happened and that could happen. So she made sure she said something about it. Um, for the other, you know, other observers, they're being held up. Their time is, you know, if they've been abused themselves, they might be taking that energy and, like, it might be d more disturbing to them than it is to other people. Um, so then your goals are for the clerk to stop, you know, to help the clerk not be abused anymore. And for observers to get them through the line, to keep, you know, things flowing, to restore neutrality to our public spaces so that we can go out back to ignoring other humans the way we were intended to. Um, okay, so the OS in, look at the clerk. What is her situation, right? Can, or can the clerk handle themselves? Are they doing a good job of it, right? You don't want to step on other people's tails if they can take care of themselves because that's not what we're doing. The man, what is his power, what is his power, what is your power dynamic in the situation? What is his privilege versus your privilege? My mom's privilege is that she's a woman with children. She's a white woman with children. <laughs> she can totally say things like motherfucker and <laughs> kick your asses and stuff like that and get it across that she's white compared to herself. So that was her privilege. The onlookers, what kind of general area are you in? Different cultures are going to respond to things differently. Um, if you're at a Mexican market, it might go down differently than if it was like at a Chinese market or you know Ralph's or something. Uh, setting and context. The yeah, again, if if there's a manager, if there's a system in place, if there's someone right over there that could fix it, that's one thing. If you're on the street or the manager fucked off for the day, or that person is the manager and just doesn't know how to handle someone yelling at them, then that is all stuff to consider. And then the uh, and how interested the cops would be in the setting is also part at the back of my mind for a lot of it. Privilege calculus, uh, so we talked about that. And then the legality of what you're about to do. Uh, don't do anything that, again, try to mitigate future consequences when choosing your attack vector. Try to make sure that the stuff you're doing isn't stepping through a system's laws, isn't in a way that will come back on you. There's some laws we all know that they're more suggestions, but you know, make sure you know what the full scope, or if not the full scope, at least some of the scope of the consequences for what you're doing could be. Then you formulate, do you use the careless vector, the comfort zone, the helpful, or the fear vectors? Uh, or the discomfort zone slash peer pressure vectors. And then you make your attack and then you, again, record a report, uh, depending on whether you're in security or uh, in civilian life or whatever. Group hacks, so at college, Sorry, we kind of already went through this more than I went to, but that's all right. We're kind of, we need, in the field. So, so for, if you're on an OSINT thing and someone comes up and asks you what you're doing there, right? What's your problem? Your problem is to make sure that they feel comfortable and your problem is that someone is questioning your legitimacy there. <laughs> what is your goal to be able to either Prove your legitimacy, well, prove your legitimacy first off and then either get more data if they're the kind of person who can give you data or, you know, or just get past them. Austin, what can you tell about the situation? We've talked about how to do that. Formulate uh, your attack, attack, and then report. Sorry, this is gonna be. Um, and then if you're doing attacks, someone, you know, you might be in the middle of an attack and something else might come up. Someone might come up and tap you on the shoulder. Someone else might come up and like, hey, what are you doing there, or whatever. Uh, so do the same thing, you see what the problem is, you see what the goal is, just trust the structure. Uh, I got, 
the reason I'm so big on structure is when I was in high school, I was in um, academic decathlon, and one of the things we had to learn to do is do extemporaneous speeches. So the way she taught us to do it is keep the basic outline of a speech in your head and then pick out your three points and then try to support them as you go and you do your speech. So I like structure, I like outlines. I think that thinking in outlines is super helpful because if you're in the middle of a stressful situation, your mind not, you might, it might not immediately come to you what to do, but if you break it down in terms of, okay, but there's a structure to approach this, it's easier for you to apply it to, you know, and to get started. Remember, like, sorry, so I may have been a little neurotic with these. Anyway, um, there is, um, okay, so before I get to the conclusion, I'd, I'd like to, just one more story of, I like, I like cops, I like, you know, soldiers, I hang out in the security community, they're great. Sometimes you do get one who's on a power trip, though. And so I was, my ex-husband is Thai Chinese uh, and some other stuff, and he, he had his, you know, little Hapa daughter with him, and she's adorable, and we're leaving a friend's house in a, a gentrifying neighborhood, and we, he puts the baby in the back, I get in the car, he comes around, gets in the car, he starts to pull away from the curb and doesn't actually get away from the curb. And then we got pulled over, <laughs> pulled over. Um, the cop ran my ex-husband's plates, found out he was an ex-con, asked him to step out of the car, and I hear the conversation happening, and I know this is gonna take a while. <laughs> and I'm white, I don't do this. This isn't something that happens to me, so fuck him. So I pull the baby out of the back seat. Baby loves back seat. Baby is struggling and crying and wants to go back in, in the car seat. I get out of the car. Cop's like, ma'am, can you get back in the car? I'm like, well, She's just really distressed um, with, with her daddy not being here, so can we go look at the, at the lights on your car while you guys finish up? And he's like, I, I guess, because really what's the objection to someone kindly just, you know, I have a baby, they're fussy. Why are you hurting the baby? <laughs> Take the baby over to the car. Baby, what color's that? Red! Baby, what color's that? Boo! And the cop's like, all right, you guys can go have a good night. <laughs> Again, non-confrontational, not aiming it at the cop, not trying to argue my ex-husband has rights because he's a felon, it's gonna happen. He's an ex-felon, it's gonna happen. Um, but I'm manipulating the situation to get what I need just because this is dumb. <laughs> this is unpleasant to me. Uh, and I do highly, highly uh, suggest that you practice on people, even if you don't actually have a problem with them just finding out what kind of things can change a mood or a situation just by doing it when you're interacting with anyone. Um, it's a fun test and it's instructive and you learn a lot more that way uh, before you actually are confronted with a real situation that you need to already know how to do the thing. In conclusion, so how people present can serve as os int. It, we are not supposed to stereotype, we are not supposed to profile, however, profiling is super helpful on the street. You can pick up quite a lot from everything about a person. Um, people do more than they think they will. Uh, if you really hit, you know, if you engage with someone in the correct way, they will go above and beyond your wildest dreams <laughs> because they want to be helpful. People will say more than they think they will. This isn't necessarily because they want to. This is, uh, so I took one class where a detective came in and talked to us about interrogation techniques and that this was one of his. People will say more than they think they will. He's like, people always think that they're gonna lie to the cops in interrogation, but eventually they just end up saying the thing. It's, they, they don't, they, we're not good at lying, we're not good at maintaining lies over a long amount of time. We're just not as clever as we think they are, and, and certainly, you know, law and order has given us false hopes <laughs> uh, in terms of that, how well we can hold out. Elicit the right narrative and emotion by using the most appropriate vector, and, and use procedure outline to take the best advantage of, uh, of whatever situation. So here are some more sources for some more reading. Some of it's pretty basic to social engineering. Some of them are a little bit more specific papers for the psychology aspect of it. And so now go forth and fuck with people. Okay, so there's two ways, right? If you can, you, you can use the accent. You know, you, British people, right, get away with all kinds of shit here because we're like, no, but say it again. 
oh, you're threatening to murder me? That's kind of hot. <laughs> like, um, if it's certain accents, uh, make it exotic. I mean, if you've got a, a Latin accent, that's not necessarily a bad thing. As much as shit's happening in the world about, about you know, the wall and all that stuff, you, you, know, you can still turn that into make it sexy, make it like the kind that we used to see in the 1950s, right? The, you know, Ricky Ricardo, that shit. Like, just you know, engage, as long as you make it pleasant to listen to. It doesn't really matter how you talk or how well you can speak, although it helps. Um, what really matters is that you are exuding that thing that they want. Uh, so accents are great. I'm super fan. Sometimes I'll use accents to seem less informed about a situation. People will feel more responsible towards me because they think I don't know what the fuck is happening. Uh, just because I have an accent, people like to think down about foreign things. Unless, yeah. Anything else? All right, good. We're all going to go out and manipulate the world and be the change we want to see? Yeah. All right.